welcome to episode 23 of Dano Says So. Um, my guest today, you will know him from Soulside, Seven League Boots, Rain Like the Sound of Trains, and uh, much to my enjoyment, he is the author of Revolutionary Threads. Um, we've been chasing each other around for a couple of weeks. I'm glad on this holiday weekend we caught up with each other. Bobby Sullivan, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's good to be here. Yeah, all right. Um, Earlier this year, August, if I'm to understand the internet, but I just remember when the buzz was coming out about it. But Soulside did a seven inch, or did a did a single. The 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 ship and uh, is it Malin says? Yeah, and, was and that? there's what? a third song too. Is that? Um, but there's a third song if you if you buy the record, or you can just go on Bandcamp and get it. But if you buy mm -hmm. the record, it's a free download. Okay. So what was that experience like circling back to Soulside after all this time? It was pretty incredible. You know, we we did our first reunion for the premiere of the Salad Days movie. I remember when that uh, happened. I've watched Scott videos Crawford, of that set. Yeah. And, you know, we, we realized, that, hey, there's a demand for this. And mm -hmm. um, Alexis and Scott are pretty much still, and Johnny, um, traveling musicians consistently with Girls Against Boys and Paramount Styles and other bands. So it was really easy for them to just plug me in and Scott lives over in Europe. And so um, it really made sense for us to go over there. We did a short US tour, which mm -hmm. was exhilarating for a bunch of 50, 50 something year olds. You know, we did right. Philadelphia, Chicago, San Diego, LA, and San Francisco in five nights. Wow. And, you know, we never yeah. did anything like that when we were young. You know, at this age and with grown up responsibilities, though, I think that's what tours are now. Yeah, we had to do it that fast. <laughs> yeah, like for I'm I'm in a band now uh, that over the last couple of years, several times we'd start chewing on the notion of going to Europe. Right, the first time I went to Europe, I went for six weeks. After we boiled yeah. it down, looked at the responsibilities of one member who's got you know, who's a father, the other you know, private business owner and everything else. We're like, a European tour for us geezers is ten days. Exactly. Yeah. So that's basically what we did. And um, Scott, our guitar player, lives in Vienna. Okay. So, um, you know, it ended up being about two weeks with practice. And then we recorded that seven inch in Prague. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, frankly, the writing new material was just amazing for me personally, I think for all of us. But, um, you know, I always wanted to write music with Soulside um, ever since we broke up because yeah. they've all still been playing together all these years. So, I mean, I don't think you could have a tighter rhythm section to play with. Right. Yeah. Now, the, it, it, it's a trippy thing because, you know, in getting ready for this, I hop in the car and throw on all the old Soul Side stuff on, on Spotify. And uh, there are two things I wanted to share with you. You and I were shooting messages back and forth earlier this year outside of this context. And we were talking about that San Diego show we were, that, we, that you guys played, that uh, thing. Well, I remember it when I, when I saw you live then, and I, I remembered it when I was listening to Soul Side this week. I was like, some fuckers can just sing and some just can't, you know. And, and, and congratulations on, on a, having and still having a voice like gravy, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, it's it's I I I I've never been good at hiding my envy, so instead I wave it like a flag. <laughs> um, well, I, I I gotta say this time I actually learned how to sing because I didn't lose my voice on this last tour. Yeah, that really helped me, and I think you can you can kind of hear it in the recording because. Our last album, Hot Bodygram, we recorded at the end of basically a six-month tour. And you can really hear it in my voice. You got leather throat by then. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, writing lyrics um, more than 20 years after the fact, did you find that in a, a different perspective crept in? Well, it was hard not to write every song about Trump, uh, for sure. But mm -hmm. no, I mean, I, I think the immediate realization when we started playing again was like, wow, all these songs are still relevant. You know, that's kind of sad mm -hmm. in a way. Cause you know, we, I first started writing about Reagan. And so right. here we are again, or were again uh, with, with basically that. So no, I mean, it was for me, like one of the songs, actually the third song is called, um, survival that one I actually had written like I never stopped writing songs mm -hmm. so I still have plenty of songs ready uh, when we come up with some more music and so that song uh, was a precursor like I had written it without soul side the are rest you, are, were right. yep so you're the in rest a situation were on now the, with, <laughs> the, the joys ahead, of not being in the same room I apologize yeah. um 
are you in a situation now where you've got to taste again and, you, and it's a thing you're not going to let go of so easily? You know, you see when you say, as we write more music, I mean, so is that a, is that a definite thing? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, when we were doing this record with Discord, mm -hmm. uh, the, the way Ian put it was, you know, as, you know, as far as breaking even goes um, mm -hmm. and justifying the expense, like this seven inch is really like a calling card. It's not something you can really make money on. An EP, you'll lose money on because it costs the same as an LP uh, to put out, but you know the ticket price is less. So an album is really what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think for all of us, Soulside is a unique sound and energy for what we all do. I mean, I'm not in any other bands, but all those guys are. And so it 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 fits well to just like channel that energy for for Soulside songs. Mm -hmm. And like Johnny and I um, already started a new song. We're trying to get the drummer involved now. But honestly, my answer to that question is my work, the wonderful thing about working um, and running a co-op is that it's such a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. I actually, I, you know, I realized it at like 10 years ago. I was like, wow, I actually don't have to do music. It used to be I had to do music because mm -hmm. of everything else in my life. That was my escape or my release or whatever. Mm -hmm. So no, it's just a, it's a labor of love now. It's not something I have to do. I think the reason I asked is I stepped away from music for about nine years at one point. And when I came back, my voice was different. My perspective was different, but my passion for it wasn't. And right. I made a conscious decision. As long as it's in my power not to quit, I'm not quitting again. You know? You know, unless yeah. you know, unless the, and unless that appetite radically changes, well, I think I think uh, a large number of people are glad that you are back at it. Um, I'm certain of it. I had old friends and guys I did bands with commenting on the seven inch earlier this year. Those were fun dialogues. Yeah, it was really cool to put something out there and get that reaction. Yeah. You know, when we when we toured the U.S., it really was old heads coming out to see us, so it didn't seem like it would necessarily justify doing it again like mm -hmm. i think you know people saw us maybe the people that missed us saw us but uh you know when we went to europe the interesting thing this time was it was the 30-year reunion of our tour there um in 89 mm -hmm. and it was the polish contingent that really was the came up with the was the brainchild for doing this because you know when we went there in 89 it was still behind the iron curtain and mm -hmm. so um those people that organized those shows, their lives completely transformed. I mean, the Berlin Wall came down six months after our shows there. Oh, and we even played, in, even played in East Berlin. And, um, you know, an illegal show in a church. And so th these were events that completely changed our lives and broadened our perspective. It wasn't just, you know, the US punk scene had, had become pretty familiar. And this was like, wow, this is a world phenomenon. Mm -hmm. you know, culture is everywhere. Um, so going back was pretty amazing, especially because, you know, in Poland, we, when we played, we played in, uh, they didn't have, you know, nightclubs or I don't know what they had for concert venues, but mm -hmm. we played in culture centers. And so um, I can pull up this shot of us unloading at a gig. Well, it looks like you're playing the White House, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's that was one of the shows. OK. And so it was really interesting to go back now. And it's like they have punk clubs like we went to Warsaw and Krakow. And, and there's, you know, just like what we have in the U.S. now. I um, went so, and go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, the wall coming down was, was such a pivotal thing because I did Europe my first time in 94, at which point it had been down for quite a while and it still was it was dominant in German conversation and going and seeing where the wall had been. And for our drivers spending time in the East, the, the, that was still the crux. That was still the, this, the, the central nature of what was going on. You know, was, yeah. Yeah. We had to play East Berlin. We, we went across check Park, che, uh, checkpoint Charlie as tourists wow. with no equipment. We snuck in essentially and met this dreadlock kid at the tourist zone. Mm -hmm. And he took us on the tram. And we went through the city where you're not supposed to go. And, uh, you know, there's soldiers around and we're like, um, is this cool? He's like, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's illegal, but the church is a sanctuary. So once we get in there, everything's fine. And, it's you know, there's a, there's a book about the, 
the scene. I guess this, this might be backwards, but it's burning no, no, down no, no. the house. Well, you know what? It's not backwards, and I don't. I can't remember any time where an image or something in anybody's background showed up backwards on one of these. So I think we're safe. If okay, not, if not, we've got our. Me. If not, we've got our first solid belly laugh of the interview. So. <laughs> but this is a book about the punk scene there and how mm -hmm. the punk scene actually influenced the movement that brought down the wall. Okay. You know, so yeah. it was it was no small feat for the punk rockers there. Right. Okay. Um. Let's get into the political. And uh, the best segue is, 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 you know, by way of the fact that you've written a very political book. Um, you were kind enough a few months back to send me revolutionary threads, and it was, it was a fun thing to burn through. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect, and mm -hmm. I'm sure this is not an alien sensation to you, but as someone who has no tether to Rastafari, I, I come into it wondering whether or not it's going to be a fairly, fairly alienating text. No, what it does very much is, is translates how your faith applies or is even inf informed by your politics and vice versa. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to look at my notes real quick. Uh, almost going chronologically through the book, one of the first things where I really found myself page turning was when you presented um, sort of instances of revisionist history. Uh, things, you know, things that had to do, you know, falsified falsified bones in Europe to try and rewrite the narrative, evidence of transatlantic travel. You want to share a little bit of that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the book really started as a mixtape of quotes. Okay. You know, like I, like on, on, on all the punk rock tours we went on, the two places that I would seek out in our spare time would be a used bookstore and a health food store. Okay. And, th and thrift stores. All right. <laughs> But, you know, I was collecting books over time and all that time to read, you know, I was collecting all these quotes and this, you know, the, the publisher turned it down 10 years ago um, because it just wasn't a cohesive text. It, like I said, it was more like a mixtape of these disparate quotes that I was trying to bring together. Okay. And, you know, uh, did you notice the, the blurb by Billy Ayers on the, well, on the so front? The thing that tripped me out was, and I've got a few, few written down, but You've got you've got you've got people from the Weather Underground. You've got a freedom writer. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you know the narrative surrounding Marilyn Buck. These are incredible people to have correspondence with and to have informing. You know your mindset for any young revolutionary type, but the way they're woven into the book, you know, is effective and is useful. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. The thing with, with Bill Ayers that was interesting, I, you know, just before I completed it, I went to an event where he was on a book tour and okay. he knew Marilyn Buck. And so I, I told him what I was doing and that mm -hmm. she and I had been pen pals for, you know, a decade. And so he was very supportive, but it's funny because they took the positive part of his blurb for my book. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I want to read the whole thing because Please I think do. he really, he gets to this, 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 the conflict inherent in the book. So he, so, I mean, you know, I, would it be would it be wise for us to inform the people who haven't read it who Marilyn Buck is, or is that or does that not yeah, come sure. directly into play into the airs book? Yeah, sure. I mean, Marilyn Buck is uh, an American revolutionary. She was um, really started out in the civil rights movement, more or less. Uh, joined the Weather Underground, and then. Mm -hmm more notoriously joined the Revolutionary Armed Task Force, which was after the repression started on the Black Panther Party and the Weather Underground people, well, they were called the Weathermen at that time. Um, you know, those factions went underground, hence the Weather Underground. They were forced to go into hiding to um, escape persecution. And so the Black Panther Party, uh, some of those members morphed into the Black Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. And the Revolutionary Armed Task Force was members from the Weather Underground, and uh, um, the the uh, the Black Panthers formed a Black White Alliance okay. uh, with Black leadership, and, and Marilyn was part of that. And she got um, she ended up participating in the liberation from prison of Asada Shakur, mm -hmm. and um, was eventually um, convicted for, I believe, during a, a bank robbery. A, 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 a policeman was shot. And I think that they ended up getting convicted for that, multiple okay. people. 
And, you know, she was interesting to us when in DC in, uh, we had a collective called the Beehive and this was in the nineties. Okay. And we were, you know, in correspondence with the Weather Underground people because we were not, we were not trying to engage in armed struggle at all. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to learn from uh, those who had you know, um, the white activists who had supported the Black Liberation Movement. Mm -hmm. And so people like Marilyn Buck became very important. And that's why I eventually wrote to her. Mm -hmm. And um, she also read an early uh, edition of the book and reflected yeah, on well, it for me, and, which was deep. It was deep because she had received major criticism from one of the sources that I used in the book. And so I sent that to her to say, hey, what's your, what's your take on this? Um, but Billy Ayers was, you know, one of the foremost members of the Weather Underground, one of the most visible partners with Bernadine Dorn. Oh, Ayers, Ayers was, Ayers was the, was the, was the, 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 the Palin conduit to try and take down Obama. I remember this. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so it says wildly provocative at the top of my book, but this is what he really wrote. Okay. So he said, there's a lot to think about here, a lot to wake up to, a lot to chew on, and a lot to quarrel with. For example, to me, a king has always been a son of a bitch. And in order to live fully, we need neither emperors nor governors, mayors nor sheriffs, no gods and no masters. But okay, this is a wildly provocative and worthwhile read. And I'm delighted that the late revolutionary Marilyn Buck emerges in these pages as the courageous and committed fighter that she was in the radical abolitionist tradition of John Brown, lived like her. Well, oh, it almost, he takes you to task for religion before agreeing with you on revolution. Exactly. And, and that's kind of like one of the things I like to say about this book is it's really me kind of reconciling Haile Selassie with Emma Goldman. Because okay. those, were the, those were the two icons that really entered my heart at the same time. And mm -hmm. I found a lot of similarities with the, with the ideas around anarchism and the Rasta faith because... <clears throat> Rastafari is decentralized and most people would say it's not even a religion you know I would say it became one but the early um, adherents were quick to say this is not a religion it's a way of life. But in your book you do a pretty good job of presenting R Rastafarianism is subject to many many interpretations yeah and as and as a different entity to witness depending on where you are yeah, and it's it's it was kind of my reaction to what happened with the internet. You know, when the when when remember when the internet came out, Dan? <laughs> well, I do because I was in the Bay Area at the time, and it was immediately a place where, where one another lifestyle cops, myself included, sniped at each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, same thing among the Rasta movement, and 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 okay. you know the many years that I had spent uh, reasoning with Rastas and learning. Mm -hmm. What came out over the internet to me was much different than what I had learned in person. And I kind of wanted to dispel the oversimplification of, you know, that, that's how I looked at it. The internet was bringing a toxicity to that like it does most things, huh? Exactly. Okay. The negative voices being the loudest, you know, the exclusionary. Yes. Keyboard warriors, even amongst the faith. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, can I, can I, I'm looking, we kind of skip it. We're skipping around in my notes, which is great. Um, I had a quote, I had a couple of quotes I wanted, I wanted to see if you would expand on. There were things that jumped out at me in the book, right? Um, mm -hmm. then you and I talked a little bit about, uh, your co-op work before we hit record, but, uh, this cooperative economics are a non-confrontational way to wage the kind of revolution every, everyday people need. Uh, you were just sound familiar, <laughs> and yeah, it's great, because to you, well, to you that that problem that probably flows as an obvious thought, and I believe that I get what you're meaning, but I would love to hear it fleshed out a bit more. Yeah, basically, you know, for me, uh, always looking to plug my, you know, in my life, getting older, looking mm -hmm. for looking for ways how to plug myself into revolution, mm -hmm. and my lesson from the '60s was that direct confrontation is some is is like a losing play mm -hmm. uh, because ba and you know basically you set yourself up as a target um you know the forces arrayed against you are much much stronger sure you can make a point but you sacrifice your your life in the end or your freedom um and not to diminish any of the work by these amazing people mm -hmm. um 
but we have to look at lessons from the past and and you know from you know i'm a father of four children too so i have to take that into consideration mm -hmm. and so yeah the co-op the co-op feeds my need to make change every day in the world in a mm -hmm. non-confrontational manner and it is it, it's profoundly different to walk into a co-op grocery store and spend your money than it is to walk into whole foods or amazon or trader joe's and give them your money and a perfect example is the co-op that I manage in Asheville, North Carolina. You know, we're a town that's being overrun by tourism. Um, you know, the cost of living is going up dramatically. Okay. And nestled in downtown Asheville is our co-op. And we own one and a half acres right there in what is becoming prime real estate. And it's not mine. Like we, we value entrepreneurialism, right? But, right. but the, mo the model, is and, and Ian pointed this out in an interview. I really loved his his take on this. It was like, yeah, the entrepreneurial model is that you build this brand so you can sell it, and then yeah. what happens when you when you sell it? Like the people still have that emotional attachment to what it was, but mm -hmm. it's not that anymore. And so yeah. the beauty of a co-op it's a no sellout scenario. Like we own all that land in downtown Asheville. We're expanding the co-op now. It's a community asset. The money that you put in the cash register stays in the community we pay the workers we you know go ahead when i was a kid uh, my grandmother owned land in elsinore california this is the most random ass thing i've ever thrown into an interview but it's what <laughs> came out of my okay and it had it had it had a little trailer on it she had four acres right um development in the area was such that she lost that to eminent domain to to the free to to the road to the expansion of the roads and the need of commercial developers in the area are you safe from situations like that? I doubt it. I don't think anybody's safe from eminent domain. Okay. But, but my point is like, so yeah, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I could say, you know what? I'm getting tired. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sell some of this. Right. And that's just not an option. You know, like the 2,500 the 2, people that own this co-op in Asheville would have to decide that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that, so that it's, is. It's, it's, it's where the economy meets democracy. And you really can't have one without the other. And that, that's the point I, I point out in, in the book too, is like you saw with uh, South Africa when Nelson Mandela got elected. Sure, they got political power, but they did not have power over the economy because of the World Bank and the IMF. Same mm -hmm. thing in Poland when the Solidarity pa uh, Party won. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing, the IMF and the World Bank controlled the economy, so they couldn't make the societal changes that the people were asking for and that they thought they were going to be able to make. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to me. I feel like I have a hard enough time making ends meet through not particularly noble endeavors in the things that I've done done for a living. Most of my life I've run bars. Mm -hmm. um, long term sustainable, do you feel safe in in in, in, in your decisions? Do you always gonna be able to look out, you know, for, for your offspring while you know, committing yourself fully to this noble thing. I'm not cynical about it. What I am is I'm, I'm curious because it's so, so completely different than my situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that, <clears throat> well, for me, I mean, I never had the illusion that I would, I would own 1.5 acres in downtown mm -hmm. Nashville. Right. You know, and I think that that's what, you know, I, I feel lucky to, to have been part of the generation of punk rock music where we really didn't have the option to really make money, it, mm -hmm. you know, you weren't in it for that right and i'm really glad that i was part of that because it, it it colored my thinking and everything that i do and yeah i tried to start a few businesses but yeah. like like ian i would never i wouldn't be looking to sell out but you never know what you're going to decide one day we're not all here but kai you know well i started and sold a business quite a while ago more than 20 years ago uh -huh. and i've never stopped regretting it I wish I had stayed in ownership. The financial yeah. returns, the financial returns were gone even before the desire to go back to being my own boss said it. So there's and and there's no security in capitalism. I mean, right. look at the music industry and how that changed on us. You know, mm -hmm. now you can't really same thing with publishing. I mean, it's like you can put out a book. I mean, are you gonna make money? I mean, information is is free. That's that's basically what you're looking to do. So same thing with the grocery industry and, and especially with COVID now, mm -hmm. it's like now, you know, we have to limit 
uh, our customers to 10 at a time. You know, mm-hmm. you, who knows what's going to happen next? You know, it, it's amazing that online grocery hasn't taken a hold as one would think during a, a pandemic. It's, it's still pretty, like... It's pretty big here, but the markets are still crowded. Yeah, I mean, people are still, you know, by far over 90% of the business in grocery is brick and mortar. You're going in and you're picking out your food. Mm-hmm. And I mean, hell, that's all That's all we had to do during the early days of the pandemic, mm-hmm. you know, go to the grocery right. store. Right, that's true. Um, I, want to, I want to, again, revisit some of our off-screen conversation. Um, within the context, you were telling me how I was affected by growing up in D.C., but also in the year of so much BLM activity, I want to bring up what you and I were talking about, which is the places in the book where you refer to yourself as a racially ambiguous white kid, right? Or white person. Yeah. You know, yeah. honestly, growing up and, and, you know, you and I had momentary exposure to each other in person and we're 80s kids where a very simple, you know, end racism mantra was a key element in, 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 in the budding activism hardcore. But really, you know, when the tires hit the road, race is complex. I was fascinated by your saying that. I've never really known your bloodline, let alone how it played into where you were growing up, let alone how it plays into today. So let's hit it. Well, yeah, I mean, my experience growing up was that most people considered me biracial. Mm -hmm. And I think what I had to contend with is the white privilege that I have. My birth certificate says Mm -hmm. white. Yeah. And so my name is very white. Yeah. You know, my the way I speak, you know, is very, very white, but I was raised essentially by black people in a black majority town. I mean, I went to, through the DC public school system. Mm-hmm. Most of my mentors, I mean, the cops, uh, the principals, you know, the social workers were all black people. Uh, mm-hmm. We couldn't grow up without being influenced by black culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think my high school was, I mean, 70 to 80% African-American mm-hmm. and the rest other. You know, so, but I, I personally, yeah, I, I think white privilege is a thing that we all have to wrestle with and acknowledge to the point where, yeah, I felt like for me to say, yeah, I'm a person of color would be disingenuous. It's interesting, you know, and, and so far outside my experience that I'm glad I asked. Um, this year, um, you're a guy in your 50s, you know, we're 80s kids. Um, with everything that went on, did your sense of responsibility or even your sense of an active role in protest and being a voice counter to so much of the, the racist ugliness that went on this year, did it change from what it was when you were younger? Because I found myself sometimes feeling an obligation, particularly as a clearly, you know, cranky old white guy, to not script myself as being at the forefront of anything and sort of being assigned responsibly to a position where I needed to learn or l- listen as much as speak. You know, did you go through any of that or? I I had the exact same reaction and I struggled with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I live within earshot of downtown Asheville. So as my kids are all on the front lines, Mm -hmm. I'm listening to the explosions and I'm doing dishes and, you know, basically thinking, okay, well, I'll be the one to bail them out, you know. But I, I also agree that I felt like it was a time for black voices to be elevated and centered and it wasn't. You know, I think the defining yourself as an ally is an ongoing process. And, I, and we did see that happen in Asheville where too many white voices were trying to get out front. And, um, you know, I was really, really proud of my kids. The, the thing that I told them when they came home each night was write down everything you remember because you just- That's brilliant. That's really smart. Took part in history. You know, the, nothing like that's happened in our lifetimes. There is a complexity to revolutionary spaces into what I had always previously referred to as as progressive spaces that is different than what I'm used to and what I came up with. I remember when I moved to the Bay Area, the pronounced feminism there and the friendliness towards queer culture forced an immediate readjustment on my, my part, like a yeah. personal reboot, which I embraced and which I was excited to be a part of. I sometimes lament that it, I, I'm not a fan of cancel culture. You know, and I sometimes lament, I think it, it's not to be cheesy and quote Voltaire, but I sometimes lament that the perfect is very much the enemy of the good right now. And that people who are striving for noble ends thin their numbers by heavily policing one another. How do you feel about that? 
it's a real problem on the left. I mean, Donald Trump and the right showed us what works. And, right. uh, you know, I, it's a real problem on the left. And it's the same thing in, in co-op circles. You know, people like me are seen as the man sometimes, depending really? on who, who well, we when hire. When I'm looking at the screen, that's what I see, Bobby. I see the man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting because people do need to be called out. Sometimes people need to be canceled. But, you know, just like as an employer, you yeah. know, I deal with the whole person. And I think that that's what makes, um, you know, if I may be so bold to say, I think that that's what makes my leadership effective is that I'm not just going to fire somebody because they're late. It does matter what's going on in their life. It does matter how good they are. It's interesting because I am actually um, the staff that I, I manage is unionized through the Teamsters. Okay. So we have serious protocols that we have to follow. And so it wouldn't be easy for me to fire anybody anyway, but we do have to do disciplinary stuff. Um, and it's like you see mom and pop size businesses make the mistakes all the time of basically canceling someone because they don't like them mm -hmm. um, and firing them, because, especially at a at-will state. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting thinking about that in terms of being an employer. As in terms of being a human being, yeah, I would, I would hope that I wouldn't be so easily canceled, but I also understand, you know, people have, uh, you know, marginalized groups of people are dealing with cancellation all the time. Right, and, so, and that's why I referred to it as complex rather than just flat out wrong. Yeah, exactly. So there's this, are you at all a fan of Nick Cave? Because I wasn't until late in life, but, you know. I mean, I like his music, yeah. I mean, He, wrote, so he made a really powerful analysis of current cancel culture, and I'm, really poorly paraphrasing here, uh -huh. but he was like, he, A, he pointed out that's completely devoid of mercy, right? And the main point he raised is that it does not acknowledge the fact that every single person you encounter right now in this day is in a very specific point in their personal evolution. And if you, well, if, on, if, on, if on the whole you believe in that person's character, who are you to, you know, drive them from the circle when the place that they may arrive at is mighty and powerful and useful in a way you don't even understand right now. I mean, it's a fair point, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, I, and I wonder about this younger generation because they're documenting everything they think, everything, every moment. Right. So, so exactly. later, you know, you know, are they going to get canceled for, you know, being part of the Black Lives Matter movement or, you know, anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting. We'll, uh, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say, it'll be interesting to see how the, how the youth who are still getting restless mm -hmm. sort all this out. It will. It absolutely will. Um, listen, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm also like sort of really satisfied where we, where we landed topically. I am glad to hear that you are going to keep doing music. I have every intention of circling back and asking you to do this again, all right? Okay. Sounds okay. good. Well, let's call it a day for today, Bobby, and thank you so much, sir. You got it, Dan. Thank you. Thank you.